Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to questions for any topic which you've covered so far, not necessarily things from yesterday. Uh, we have Srinath ji. Uh, we are not getting audio from you. Can you please check your mic? Yes, sir. My question. My question is, uh, what are combiners in Hadoop, and uh, when should the combiners be used? Uh, if you remember, uh, yesterday we had uh, uh, talked about these uh, multiple levels of uh, radius. What happens is when you run a mapper on a particular machine, it processes lots of records, potentially millions or tens of millions of records per machine. Now, if you take a typical radio scenario, it's going to do some kind of aggregation across all these records. And you have a lot of records locally which you can already aggregate. Supposing we were doing word count and uh, it's this obviously the same word will occur across many documents which are being processed at one particular site. But then if you go across site, uh, you know, many documents which are spread across multiple machines, uh, again the word will recur. So the idea is that you can do partial aggregation locally before you ship data across the network. And that will reduce the amount of network traffic. Uh, if you recall, I mentioned that the uh, bottleneck in many of these computations is the network today because the speed of this has been increasing uh, quite a lot. The speed of uh, flash disk has increased even more. Uh, but the speed of the network uh, is still at 1 gigabit per second, typically. Or if you pay more money, you can get 10 gigabit. Uh, so uh, you want to reduce the amount of network traffic, so you can do local aggregation. The job of the combiner is to do the local aggregation. So you have an option in Hadoop to uh, turn on a combiner or not to turn it on. So if you uh, set a combiner, it will be run locally on uh, whichever machine is running map. That will do a local sort and then do a local reduce on whatever data is available locally. And that reduce function is not the original reduce function, but the um, combiner function. In fact, uh, Hadoop takes a shortcut and says that if you don't specify a separate combiner function, but you ask for the combiner to be run, then the same reduce function will be run in place of the combiner function also. So that's basically what happens. You do local aggregation, then ship less data across the network, and then do aggregation again. So you can count locally and then add up the counts later on. Bharatiya Vidya Peet, do you have a question? Uh, sir, how can I calculate the, what is the procedure to calculate the cost of query? How do you compute the cost of the query? I did not go into that in detail for lack of time. But when we covered uh, the individual operations, if you recall, we talked about the cost of some of the operations. You know, I said that this is the number of seeks it will do, this is the number of uh, block transfers it will do and so forth. Right? Uh, so those cost estimates for individual operator were based on the sizes of the inputs and the number of matching records and so forth. So the issue is how do you estimate the sizes of various inputs as well as the number of records that match a selection condition. For lack of time, I didn't go into it. It's described in a lot of detail in uh, chapter 13 of our book and in the slides also, uh, in the full version of the slides. Uh, but uh, to give you a brief picture, uh, supposing I, I'm doing a full file scan. If I know the size of the relation, I know uh, how many blocks would be transferred, and so I know the cost of the file scan. If I'm doing an index lookup on a key, I know uh, you know roughly how many IOs will be required, assuming that the index pages are not memory resident. Uh, so in the worst case, uh, every single page of the index has to be fetched from disk. But more realistically, given uh, today's memory sizes, uh, uh, you know although the uh, Formulae in the book uh, talk of the cost as uh, being proportional to the height of the tree. Uh, for uh, most medium sized relations, uh, we can assume that the inner nodes of a B plus tree are likely to be in memory uh, because they get access more frequently than the leaf level nodes. Uh, if you have a fan out of 100, an inner node is 100 times more likely to get access than a corresponding leaf node. So uh, many uh, practical databases assume that inner level nodes are all in memory and then just take uh, one I.O. for the leaf and then maybe one more I.O. for the data for a key and so forth. So that is for individual operations. But now if I have a selection uh, A less than 10, how do I estimate how many records will satisfy that? Or if I have a selection age equal to 23, how do I know how many records will satisfy that? For that I need some extra information. I need to know, for example, a histogram of uh, distribution of ages in the database that I'm, uh, in, in the relation that I'm querying on. So if it was students, uh, you know, uh, age distribution would be maximum between, let's say, around uh, 17 to 
22 or 23 for undergrad students. Uh, so, if I ask for a student of with age equal to 40, I can estimate that there would be very few uh, for a normal college. Open universities are different. So, uh, I can have histograms to estimate the number of uh, records that satisfy a particular condition. Uh, the next issue is if I have a join, how do I estimate the uh, output size of the join? So, again, uh, there are uh, formulae for that. Uh, special cases are if the join is on a foreign key, then the uh, size of uh, the referencing relation will be the size of the output because it is a foreign key join. Every assuming there are no nulls every tuple in the referencing relation will have exactly one match in the referenced relation. So, the size of the join we can estimate thereby. What about other join conditions which are not on uh, foreign key? There are uh, formulae for estimating these. Uh, you can make some, uh, you have to make some assumptions. You could assume uniform distributions or if you have histograms, you can actually get a better estimate. Uh, so, you uh, thereby get estimate of the size of a join which in turn will help you estimate the cost of the next operation up in the tree. Similarly, I will need uh, you know number of distinct values or histograms to be computed on the output of a join. So, again there are uh, statistical techniques for doing these. Uh, some of these are described in the book. Uh, if you want uh, more information about how a real database does it, um, there is a lot of information about PostgreSQL's um, cost estimation. Postgres has nice documentation that way. So, if you want to know more about it, uh, you can go to the PostgreSQL uh, website or uh, another alternative is uh, on the course Moodle page, it is teaching and research resources. Go in there and I have a link to CS631 implementation techniques for database systems. So, this is a course on database internals and um, I have not only information, uh, you know, the, the book chapters that I cover in that course are here. I cover these in a lot of detail. In, over, in this workshop, I am covering uh, most of these chapters uh, only in bits and pieces. In this implementation course, I cover it in detail. And correspondingly, uh, here on the right side, there is a lot of information about how PostgreSQL does these things because they have, uh, that is a real database and it is nicely documented, better than most other databases. So, you can uh, read these up to understand what is going on. Okay, so let us get back and take one last question before I start today's topics. Uh, we have NRA. Hello. Good morning, sir. Sir, I wish to know the difference between timestamp locking and two-phase locking. Okay. Uh, there is no such thing as timestamp locking. It is timestamp based concurrency control protocol versus locking based concurrency protocol. And uh, that is a good question to get started because that is exactly the topic I was going to cover right after the last question. So, you have asked the right question to lead into timestamp protocol. That is the next topic. So, let me get back to the slides and answer your question in great detail. Well, uh, timestamp uh, based concurrency control is coming up in just a second, but before that I want to wrap up on uh, locking protocols. So, far we have assumed that uh, we lock uh, individual rows of the uh, tuple uh, of the relation. So, we say when we want to access a particular data item, we lock that tuple. Now, locking can be a different granularities. In theory, you could even lock at the level of individual attributes of individual tuples, although I do not know any database system that actually supports that currently. But you can uh, certainly have other granularities of locking. For example, if, a, uh, if there is a select query which is going to read every single uh, row in a relation, that is going to acquire a lot of locks. And if that relation is very large, where do you store information about the locks? Uh, I briefly mentioned yesterday that there is a data structure called a lock table which keeps track of which transaction has which locks. But if there is a relation with 10 million or a billion rows and I have to keep track of uh, 10 million or a billion locks, it is going to take a lot of space and that is not really feasible. The lock table will become extremely large. I do not want that. And the solution to that problem is what is called multiple granularity locking. The idea is instead of getting locks on separate records, uh, you could get locks on an entire uh, page or on an entire relation. Now, uh, multiple granularity lets you choose adaptively between these. Now, uh, if you go back to uh, the early databases, they did not do tuple level locking. They actually did page level locking. 
And after a while, they realize that page level locking affects concurrency because many times people want to access different tuples in the same page, but only one of them can lock a page at a time. So, although the other tuple is not being used, it cannot be locked by the other transaction. So, uh, from uh, uh, page level locking, people uh, started introducing row level locking. But if you do row level locking naively, you have the problem which I just mentioned, too many locks. So, multiple granularity locking allows you to adapt between these two in a nice way. Uh, so, what you have to do is, uh, you, if you want to lock an individual record, you do not lock the whole relation, but you leave a marker on the relation saying, I am locking individual records below. That marker will block somebody else from locking the whole relation. So, the problem here is that, I have locked the record, while you go and lock the relation. We are locking apparently two different things, the lock manager might allow both of us to get exclusive locks, me on a tuple and you on the whole relation. Obviously, they conflict. So, what needs to be done is, if I want to lock a tuple, I will leave a kind of marker at the relation level, it is called an intention lock, which says, uh, I leave a marker on the relation saying, I am locking individual tuples. If you come by and say, I want an exclusive lock on the relation, uh, the lock manager will say, uh-uh, uh, suggestion has a intention lock on the relation. Uh, and uh, he has now got a lock on, or his transaction has got a lock on the individual rows. On the other hand, if you come by and say, I also want to lock individual rows, your first step will be to get an intention lock on the relation. And both of us can have intention locks on the relation at the same time. And then you will lock a tuple, and as long as the tuple you want to lock is not the same as the tuple I have locked, you can go ahead. So, uh, multiple granularity locking has this nice property that uh, you can uh, eat your cake and have it too. Uh, you can choose to lock at the appropriate granularity. Now, how do you choose which granularity? You if you are using SQL, this is easy, because the uh, query optimizer knows what is going on. It has the plan. So, if it is doing a full relation scan, it is going to say lock the relation. If it is doing an index scan, it will get an intention lock and then lock individual rows. It puts that as part of the plan. So, that is uh, a very brief introduction to multiple granularity locking. Um, and there is one more issue. Uh, so, okay, timestamp is being pushed back a little in time. I told you, uh, whoever asked the last question, that that is the next topic. Well, I lied. It is not the next topic, it is two topics down. Uh, so, let me cover the phantom phenomenon before we move on to timestamp. So, the phantom phenomenon can be explained as follows. Let us take a relation, uh, transaction that scans a relation. Say T1 says, find the list of students taking CS101. Okay, Let us say that the way it is done is by scanning all the records of a relation. Um, or even if you have an index, the same thing happens. You find all those records that correspond to CS101 and find all of those. And uh, we can get uh, shared locks on these because I am not updating it. I am just finding the list of students. Here is another transaction T2, which inserts a new student in uh, 101. In other words, if you remember our schema, uh, this would look at the takes relation, and this would add a new record to the takes relation. Now, this transaction has, let us say this has already run. So, look down here. T1 has found all students taking CS101, and it has locked all the tuples uh, corresponding to 101. Now, T2 comes and in inserts a new student in CS 101. That, that is, it adds a new record in the takes relation. Now, do these two conflict? This locked, shared locked all the records that it found, which had 101. This exclusive, insert by the way, exclusive locks the records. Uh, the same issue can also happen with update. I will come back to that. So, this insert exclusive locked that uh, particular takes uh, row that it want, it inserted. Now, do these two conflict on any record? And the answer is no. This is a new record. Therefore, T1 never saw that record. It never even tried to lock it. So, it is a brand new record. So, T2 can get the lock. So far, so good. Now, supposing T2 updates the total credits of the same student, 10101, and it commits. When it commits, it is going to release all its locks, and it goes away. So far, so good. Now, supposing T1 reads the total credits of the student 10101, it is going to get a lock at this point. And what is the value it sees? T2 has already updated that and it has committed. 
So, T 1 will see that value. Now, something very strange has happened. T 1 has seen one of the updates of uh, T 2, namely the update of the total credits, but it has not seen the insert which T 2 did of this new record. Now, clearly this violates serializability. We have a problem. Uh, let me emphasize this once again, in case you did not understand it. Let me use the whiteboard. So, uh, we were looking for uh, those students who had taken C S 101. So, there is a number of students. Okay. Let me, uh, so these are actually uh, not exactly students, they are rows in the takes relation. Okay. So, takes has something C S 101, another one C S 101 and so forth. So, T 1 S locks all of these. Now, T 2 insert a new row. So, what has happened here? Uh, it is a brand new row. So, T 1 has not locked it. Therefore, T 2 is allowed to lock you know create that row, lock it and uh, insert it basically. Next, T 2 update student uh, with uh, um, you know id 10101 okay this is a different relation it's a different record it updates that so it gets an x lock so it's locked it and then t2 commit so t2 is done now t1 reads student 10101 and is it blocked? No, because T 2 has released all its locks and gone away. So, T 1 is allowed to read the updated value of this student. Therefore, if you see the precedence, T 2 has written something which T 1 read. On the other hand, there is another thing which T 2 wrote, which namely the this row inserted into the takes relation, which T 1 did not see. So, if you looked at that row, it would appear that uh, T 1 ran before T 2. So, with respect to that row, the serialization order is T 1 is before T 2. With respect to the update on student, T 2 is before T 1. So, you have a cycle. This is not serializable. That is the problem. And that problem is called the phantom phenomenon. Uh, it turns out it can happen with inserts as we saw, but also with updates. So, for example, um, if a T 2 instead of inserting a new student, uh, a new record in takes, took a particular record in takes, which corresponded to say C S 102 and updated it to C S 101. That is more or less this, uh, you know, that record would not have been locked earlier by T 1 and that is more or less the same as deleting the old record and inserting a new record. So, the problem also happens with updates. So, uh, this particular problem it turns out is because we are only locking tuples. But at the same time, T 1 is actually reading more information. It is what it is doing is it is finding out what all records are uh, have uh, you know course ID equal to C S 101 in the takes relation. Now, in order to know this, it is not enough to read only the records which have a uh, value equal to 101. It is reading some other information which helps it decide that that is it. There are no more records with C S 101. Where is this information? One way is it reads all the records in uh, the takes relation. Another is it might use an index to find this. Whatever it is, it is read information that told it there are no other records. Now, T 2 has gone and updated that information, uh, which T 1 used to uh, decide that there are no more records. So, the issue is that it is pure tuple level locking is not enough. You have to do something more. Uh, there is other information which needs to be locked and the book describes details of how to solve this problem. Uh, there is something called index locking, which is a widely used uh, thing to uh, prevent the phantom phenomenon. Now, interestingly or shockingly, depending on how you look at it, uh, Oracle and PostgreSQL versions before 9.1, both of them did not implement, uh, uh, you know, did not prevent phantom problem. And not only did they not do that, they lie. If you go read the Oracle documentation, uh, they uh, calmly say, you know, Oracle does not have the phantom problem. It turns out that the word phantom problem is uh, used uh, loosely in different ways by different people. And if you see one of the early uh, papers in this area, it defined it in a specific way, uh, which 
In fact, the snapshot isolation, which we will see shortly in Oracle, actually does not uh, violate. So, if you look at it in a very narrow sense, okay, maybe it does not violate it. But if you look in the sense of uh, violating serializability uh, and the more general definition of the phantom problem, Oracle definitely has uh, is vulnerable to the phantom problem. And so was PostgreSQL, but they fixed it in a recent release in, uh, in 9.1, uh, they fixed this particular thing using index locking. Now, this actual uh, problem is very old. The solution is also very old. IBM had realized this many moons ago and fixed it in their databases decades ago. Okay. So now, let us move on to timestamp based protocols, which was a question. Uh, this is a different class of protocols, which do not depend on locking. Um, so, what actually they do some kind of locking internally, but uh, let us not worry about the implementation. Let us look at the logical level. Logically, each transaction is issued a timestamp when it enters the system. So, uh, you can read the value from the clock as long as two transactions do not get the same timestamp. Or you can have a counter which keeps getting incremented each time a new transaction comes, the counter gets bumped up by one. So, it is a logical timestamp. It could be a logical time. So it does not have to be an actual time of day. We do not care. Now, the following things happen. The idea is that transaction should be serialized by whatever timestamp they were assigned, the times when they entered the system. So, each transaction has a timestamp. We denote it by T s of T j or T s of T i for transaction T i and T j. So, if a transaction came first, its timestamp will be less than a time sum of a transaction that came later. Now, in addition to transaction timestamps, we also have timestamps for data items. So, if you take a data item Q, it actually has two timestamps. The right timestamp of Q is the largest timestamp of any transaction that executed write Q successfully. So, whenever a transaction succeeds in writing Q, and what do I mean by succeeds? There are some rules coming up. If those are satisfied, the write is allowed to proceed. And the timestamp is set to the uh, timestamp of this new transaction, uh, which will be the largest to write Q up to that point. Read timestamp is also stored for every data item, and it is the largest timestamp of any transaction that executed read of Q successfully. So, again, there are rules for reading which are coming up. So, the, that's, so every data item has two timestamps read and write timestamp. Now, here are the rules. And what the rules ensure is what is shown here. Any conflicting read and write operations are executed in timestamp order. What does this mean? Supposing there is a conflicting read and write which arrive out of timestamp order, then uh, the, the a transaction is going to be rolled back. And let us see exactly how this is done. Supposing a transaction T i issues a read of Q. Now, supposing its timestamp is less than the right timestamp of Q, then what does it mean? A timestamp with a later, uh, 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 sorry, a transaction with a later timestamp has already written Q. The value which this guy should have read should have been an older value. If it reads this new value, it's going to be serialized after uh, that other transaction, but that is going to violate the timestamp ordering. This guy's timestamp is less than the timestamp of the guy who wrote Q. So the only uh, thing you can do is to roll back Ti. So, if the read timestamp is less than the write timestamp, it is rolled back. Otherwise, the read operation is executed. And one more thing is done. The read timestamp of Q is set to the maximum of the current read timestamp of Q and the timestamp of the new transaction. And you can have a situation where T70 comes and reads a data item, and it, the read timestamp of Q is set to 70. After this, T72 comes, the timestamp is set to T72. After this, T68 may come and read Q. At this point, you do not update the read timestamp. It stays at T72. So, it is the highest of the current read timestamp and the read timestamp of the current read. So, that was straightforward. Write is also straightforward. If a transaction issues a write, the first thing uh, that is checked is if the timestamp of this new transaction, the transaction which is doing the write, is less than the read timestamp of Q. What does this mean? Then somebody else has read Q and got a particular value. If I were to allow this write to proceed, that other transaction should have seen the current value being written. But it is too late. That transaction has already read the old value. And therefore, the only solution is 
to roll back the transaction and reject the write operation. So, whenever the uh, write operation transactions timestamp is less than the read timestamp of Q, the write operation is rejected, transaction roll back. Otherwise, the next step is if timestamp of Ti is less than the write timestamp of Q, then Ti is attempting to write an obsolete value. That is, a later transaction has already written Q. Again, uh, the write is rejected and Ti is rolled back. There is actually a variant which we won't get into, which allows this particular write to be ignored rather than uh, rolled back. Uh, we won't get into that. And if uh, both these conditions uh, are okay, that is, uh, they don't require a rollback, then the write operation is executed and the write timestamp of Q is set to the timestamp of whoever did the write. And that's it. It's a very simple protocol. Um, there are a few more details which I am omitting. In particular, uh, you have to make sure that transactions don't read uncommitted values. Uh, so, you have to keep track of which data items have been written. In other words, uh, you know, you can uh, keep a lock. In, in fact, many systems which do timestamp additionally keep locks to ensure that uncommitted values are not read. But the locking is not necessarily uh, two phase, uh, especially for reads. Uh, the locking is only to ensure that uncommitted values are not read. There are other solutions without using locking, but locking is usually the simplest solution for. Uh, preventing uh, uncommitted reads. So, that is the timestamp protocol. Now, even the timestamp protocol suffers from the phantom phenomenon and again solutions are there to prevent the phantom phenomenon. Uh, so, let me uh, cover the next protocol also, the validation protocol and then uh, maybe we will take a few questions after a few more slides. The validation protocol is done slightly differently from timestamp. Uh, uh, any transaction is in three phases, read and execution phase, where uh, transaction TI writes updates to local variables. It is not written back into the database per se. Then uh, if you do a, if a transaction does a write and then tries to read the value which it wrote, it will be served from the local copy. It would not go back to the database. So now uh, when it is finished, it is going to do a validation phase uh, to uh, determine if uh, the transaction can be allowed to commit. If validation succeeds, then the updates are applied to the database. Otherwise, the transaction is rolled back. So, this is the basic idea. And the key idea is how do you do the validation? And the trick is as follows. Uh, basically, uh, you, you know, let us assume that uh, validation is done serially. That is only one transaction does validation at a time and it also uh, does the right phase along with validation. This, this can be relaxed, but to simplify understanding, let us suppose that um, you have transactions which run and then when they enter the validation phase, only one transaction at a time is allowed to validate and uh, as soon as its validation succeeds, it does a write also, it finishes up. Now, what is the write phase? All the writes which are stored in local variables are now written back to into the database. That is the write phase. So, we will assume these two are done together and only one transaction is doing this at a time. Now, the basic idea of, uh, is as follows. We want to make sure that if any transaction that ran concurrently had any conflict with this transaction, then there is a potential for serialization violation. Now, if there is a conflict only with transactions that committed earlier, we do not care. They are committed and gone. You know, any value which I read will be uh, a value which they wrote. That is not an issue. The issue is conflicts with concurrent transactions and the way this protocol does it is by uh, keeping track of what all data items the transaction read and what all data items the transaction wrote. Okay, it is there in the next slide. This protocol is also called the optimistic concurrency control protocol. Since as long as the transaction is running, it is never blocked. It keeps running optimistically, assuming that all will go well during validation. Now, the actual validation is based on two principles. As I said, you want to track what each transaction read and wrote. So, these are the read set and the write set of every transaction is kept track of. Now, the uh, 
validation check will check for conflicts of read write sets with all concurrent transactions. What do I mean by a concurrent transaction? Actually, uh, it is not going to check with other transactions which are still executing. Uh, they are also concurrent, but that check will, supposing I have a transaction T70 running now uh, and uh, it wants to validate. There is another transaction T59 which has not even started validation. T70 is not going to validate against T59. T59, when it wants to validate, it will validate itself against T70. T70 will only validate itself against all transactions that ran concurrently with it and have already validated. Okay? So, uh, that is the thing here. Concurrent transactions here means transactions that were committed between the time the transaction started and when it is validating. Transactions that committed even before it started, we do not care about. They, they could not have had any influence whatsoever. So, how do you detect uh, what are concurrent transactions? Well, we have a start time and a validation time and these two are used uh, to, uh, you know, we, we have uh, for each transaction we keep track of when it started and when it validated. So, we have an interval and this interval is used to identify concurrent transactions. Now, the key thing is to check that if there is a conflict with any concurrent transaction, what do I mean by a conflict? If a concurrent transaction that has committed wrote something which this guy read, there is a conflict. If it uh, uh, read something which this guy wrote, also there is a conflict uh, because, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, it should have gone the other way. Uh, this can be relaxed. But if it wrote something which this guy wrote, again, there could be a conflict. Uh, again, uh, you know, it was concurrent. It has committed first, but there could be an issue in the serialization order because it might have done an update which this guy uh, did not see. Um, so, there are uh, various uh, conditions which have to be checked here. The read write sets have to be validated and if all goes well, uh, you know, the, then this transaction is allowed to commit. If the conditions are violated, the transaction is rolled back. That is the idea of the validation check. The key thing to note here is that a concurrent transaction may have done an update which this guy did not see and in turn if it does a write. Um, then that could have an issue. Okay, so details are in the book. I'll skip the details, and um, I will uh, maybe take just a couple of questions. Uh, I'll see if there are any chat questions first. Somebody has asked about different types of timestamps. What is the need for timestamping? Uh, I'm not going to get into great detail on timestamping. It will take me a a lot of time to explain it and I want to wrap up a few topics today. Um, but I hope I have conveyed the intuition. The timestamp protocols intuition is each transaction has a timestamp and uh, it the serialization order must respect the transaction timestamp order. So, if there is any update which is out of order with respect to the transaction timestamp, then the transaction has to be rolled back. That is the key intuition. Similarly, validation keeps track of read and write sets and if there is any conflict with the concurrent transaction, then uh, the transaction must be rolled back. And the timestamps here are used only to detect what are the concurrent transactions. The validation is done using uh, read and write sets. Uh, maybe I will take one or two questions. There are a lot of hands raised here. I will start with Serna. What is tree locking method? What is tree locking? So, uh, I did not cover that here, uh, but there are protocols called tree locking and graph locking. Now, there is a simple case of that I think I discussed yesterday, where uh, if you have, uh, you know, I, I mentioned yesterday if you remember that if uh, one transaction uh, locks in the order AB and the other in the order BA, then they are likely to deadlock. If they both lock in the order AB, then there would not be any deadlock. Okay. So, that was in the context of two phase locking. Now, a uh, variant of that which is not actually two phase, but does ensure serializability is to uh, order the items totally. And now, I can only uh, lock items in that order. Whatever items, I can lock whatever items I want, but I only have to lock in that order. And um, uh, so, there are uh, variants of this protocol. 
uh, which uh, have a partial order based on tree and then uh, there are graphs and so forth. And the idea is that there are some other rules which do not insist on two phase locking, but they have other rules about when you can lock a data item. To lock a data item, you must have locked some other data item before that. Uh, so, that is the uh, uh, ordered locking protocols. So, uh, it is not enough to just lock in an order. Uh, in general, if you want to lock an item, you should have locked its parent data item. Uh, so, again, I do not have time to get into the details. But the idea is that um, these protocols do ensure serializability without uh, requiring two phase locking. You can actually release a lock and then acquire some other lock but subject to some other rules. There are rules there also. So, uh, the tree locking and graph locking protocol are uh, all variants of this basic idea. Again, for lack of time, I will not get into the details. Uh, the details are briefly sketched in the book. Uh, there was a little more emphasis on this once upon a time, but uh, in practice, uh, it is not very widely used today. So, we briefly mention it in the book. Um, and then there are some exercises which go into this in a little more depth. The solutions are available online if you, you can see them. Any follow-up question? Yes, sir. Sir, we use cursor technique in Postgres SQL. So, how can we apply this cursor technique in Oracle? Uh, by cursor technique, uh, do you mean uh, a database cursor which lets you step over one row at a time? Is that the cursor you are talking about? Is that? Okay. So, uh, you know, there is a, uh, okay. So, first of all, I, so far I have been saying we run SQL and we will uh, get a declaratively query a whole relation. Now, there is a, another interface which uh, is supported by many databases, uh, which are, uh, which is called cursors. So, you can open a cursor on a relation, step through the cursor that is step through the records one at a time and uh, you can uh, essentially when you do this, uh, your program can operate on the current record and uh, read it, perform updates on it and then move to the next record and so forth. Uh, and along with this, uh, the locking technique used here by default is that the lock is kept only on the current row which you are reading or you can also have a cursor for updating. Uh, so, it, then it gets an exclusive lock. Uh, so, it is not uh, purely declarative, uh, but it is more uh, uh, procedural in that you are stepping through the records of the relation one at a time and performing updates. Uh, so, uh, there is syntax for this uh, saying update where uh, you are looking at update the current <coughs> record and so forth. So, yeah, Oracle, all, all databases support some form of cursors. Um, we do not uh, necessarily recommend using it uh, because it's kind of uh, procedural and low level. Um, it can be useful in times. It may be more efficient because it's releasing locks early. Um, so, uh, in order to get lower concurrency, that's one option. Uh, any follow up on that? Thank you, sir. Oh. There's a question on chat which is interesting. How is timestamp based protocol handled in a distributed transaction? Okay, that is a good question. Uh, the key to timestamp protocols are that timestamp should be increasing and um, they should be unique. So, uh, it is possible to allocate timestamps based on the local, uh, uh, you know, timestamps at each node, um, but then uh, you could uh, get into trouble because the clocks are not in sync. You, uh, one of the nodes may keep issuing a transaction with some very old timestamp which keeps getting rolled back repeatedly because uh, another site has later uh, a transaction with later timestamps. Um, the the, the timestamps are skewed. So, you uh, it runs. So, logically, it is fine for sites to issue their own timestamps and the timestamps, whichever whatever is issued by the site is used, except they should be unique. That is a minor uh, detail which is easy to take care of. You can append the site ID to the timestamp ID and that will make it unique. If two sites have the same timestamp, it is okay. Uh, but now the issue, like I said, is it is a practical issue where if a, a particular site has a uh, clock which is uh, late, which is slow, its transactions may keep getting rolled back all the time. 
So, you can do this if the things are uh, kept tightly in sync. Now, this is something which people did not pay much attention to all these years, but very recently in October 2012, Google published a paper on a system called Spanner. Let me use the whiteboard and So, Spanner is a distributed database. It is scalable, meaning you can keep adding nodes to it and it can uh, grow uh, you know in a seamless manner. It is a database in the sense that it supports uh, transactions, it supports uh, uh, you know recovery, it uh, has a notion of relations, it supports SQL and so forth. Uh, so, this system actually uh, uses timestamps and it does some very interesting things to ensure that timestamps are in sync across machines and uh, it goes to great lengths to do this. So, one of the things it does is um, it uses GPS, uh, you know GPS is global positioning system which many uh, mobile phones have today which can tell you where you are. Uh, but the core of GPS is a clock which is extremely accurate and the clock essentially uh, measures delays and from that delay you can find out this how far you are from a satellite and from that you can figure out your position. So, GPS inherently has to have an extremely accurate clock. The satellites are broadcasting the time. So, you can from, from your GPS sensor you can get the time very, very accurately. So, they use this to keep uh, all the nodes of uh, geographically distributed system in sync on time. And then they have a bunch of other tricks also. Uh, they use atomic clocks uh, which are very uh, accurate clocks. So, even if GPS dies tomorrow uh, for some reason uh, they can still continue working. So, there are a bunch of cute things they do uh, to ensure that all the nodes in a distributed system are more or less in sync with respect to their time span. And this property is critical for them for certain other things. I do not have the time to get into the details, uh, but if you are interested in this, uh, th this is a nice paper to look at. Uh, the next chat question is, uh, where is multiple granularity locking used practically? And the answer is many databases support multiple granularity locking. You may not see it externally, but they do support it internally. It is very, very important because otherwise the lock tables become very large. If you have a transaction that does a lot of updates, you get into trouble. Okay. Uh, I think I will uh, stop there. I want to wrap up the concurrency control soon and I will go back to my slides. So, the next uh, key concept is something called a multi-version scheme, uh, where you can, uh, whenever you do an update, you create a new version of a data item. And these data items are labeled by timestamp. So, the timestamp must correspond to the uh, commit order in general or serialization order. And so, let us say that um, I have uh, transactions with timestamps Q1, uh, Q11 and Q45, which successfully updated a particular data item. Then there are correspondingly three versions of the data item corresponding to Q1, Q11 and Q45. When a read comes in, you look at the timestamp of that transaction, supposing it is T34, it is going to read version Q11. On the other hand, if T50 comes along, it is going to read version Q45. So, uh, keeping in mind that there are multiple versions and a transaction can read an appropriate version, the timestamp ordering protocol which we briefly looked at has been extended to create the multi-version timestamp ordering protocol. Similarly, the two-phase locking protocol has been extended to create what is called the multi-version two-phase locking protocol. And uh, the idea here is that update transactions do two-phase locking as usual, uh, but they also have timestamps denoting when they commit. And that timestamp is used to label uh, data items which are updated and you keep multiple versions. On the other hand, read only transactions can uh, give a timestamp and say that I, I want my data at this point in time. And the read only transactions will read an appropriate version of the data and will never block. If a transaction is doing an update, it may, it will create a new version. It will not update the existing version, it will create a new version. And the read only transaction. Uh, will be allowed to proceed by reading an older version. It will never try to read the latest version. The timestamps are set such that it will never try to read the latest version. It will only read version which 
is already done and uh, no longer locked. So, uh, multi version two phase locking is a very nice protocol. Its biggest benefit is that read only transactions will never block. Moreover, read only transactions will never block update transactions. And typically, you have two kinds of transactions. You have transactions which are read only, uh, but they read a lot of records. Then you have transactions which do updates, but they are typically much smaller. They do not update all the records. Occasionally, you have such transactions, but they are rare. So, the multi version two phase locking is a very nice protocol. Uh, there is only one catch with it, which is that transactions should declare themselves as read only or update transactions. And the problem is most code does not do this. If they start a transaction, you know, say transaction begin uh, and then they execute one thing after another, when you read the first uh, part of the trans the first query might be a read only query, but then the second query may do an update. Now, if the uh, first query is read only, um, but we do not know what the next second query is, we cannot treat it as a read only transaction. Therefore, even the first query must do two phase locking and that causes problems. Then the benefit of multi version two phase is lost. So, let me repeat it. Multi version two phase has an idea that um, you have um, timestamps associated with different versions of a data item. A read only transaction also has a timestamp and it reads an existing version uh, which uh, based on its timestamp, the latest version based on its, its timestamp. Uh, so, if I have a read only transaction with timestamp T 34, it will read version Q 11, T 50 will read Q 45. There may be another update transaction which is currently going on. Update transactions use two phase locking, they conflict with each other. Uh, read only transactions do not do two phase locking, they just read the appropriate version of a data item and keep moving. So, they never block and correspondingly they do not do any locking, so they do not block update transactions. So, it is a very nice protocol, but like I said the problem is that when you have this in a system uh, which is running transactions written in Java or C or whatever else, you do not know what are the future uh, things that this transaction will do. So, this no way to label a transaction as read only. So, uh, Oracle uh, and looked at this and others also looked at this at that time and they came up with another protocol called uh, snapshot isolation and I am going to talk very briefly about that coming up. There are some implementation issues in multi value, I am going to skip that and let us come to snapshot isolation. Um, the uh, multi version two phase locking can be thought of in another way, um, which is that when a read only transaction comes, you give a logical snapshot of the database state to the read only transaction and it reads things from that logical snapshot. What is a snapshot? You take a picture. If you are in the classroom, you take a picture, everybody is frozen as they are. If they move subsequently, that is not reflected in the snapshot. So, the read only transaction will read data from that snapshot. Now, uh, since we do not know what transactions are read only, um, the pessimistic thing is to say you know uh, everything is uh, update transaction, then there is no benefit. So, the snapshot isolation protocol uh, is overly optimistic and what it does is it says let me satisfy reads of all transactions from a snapshot. I do not care whether they are going to do updates or not. If they do a read, I will give it from the snapshot. Now, this is a logical snapshot, not, it is not physical, it is not like a copy of the database has been created, but there are efficient ways of creating a logical snapshot and many databases support this today. PostgreSQL, uh, SQL Server, Oracle, they all support this uh, efficient ways of getting a snapshot. The issue is now, if an update transaction reads from the snapshot, it might read uh, some data item and update some other data item, uh, which can actually lead to non serializable execution. If it used two phase locking, it would be fine, but now the problem is it is not reading the current version of a data item. It reads from a snapshot which might be a bit old and then it may go and update that data item. So, there could be problems. So, the first published literature on snapshot isolation. Uh, was by uh, Berenson et al. in Sigmund 95, where they said that, hey, this protocol has a bug. It is not serializable. 
And the goal of that paper was to point out some flaws in how SQL had defined isolation levels. Uh, they said that the SQL definition had some uh, holes in it, and they pointed out the holes using this paper. And by introducing snapshot isolation as a uh, protocol that exposed the holes in the SQL definition. But guess what? Uh, Oracle uh, soon after uh, actually implemented snapshot isolation as part of Oracle. Uh, I'm not quite sure how uh, snapshot isolation came out in this paper. It's possible that these people knew that Oracle was going to implement it, or maybe Oracle read the paper and got the idea. I'm not very sure. But nevertheless, the idea is the protocol in published literature was shown as not being serializable, but yet Oracle went ahead and implemented it. And uh, they also misled people into thinking that uh, that protocol ensured serializability. So if in Oracle you tell it to run in serializable isolation level, it will run in snapshot isolation level, and it doesn't actually ensure serializability. Now I have several slides on snapshot isolation. Um, I will just skim the basic idea about what it does. So here are three transactions, T1, T2, T3. T1 starts, writes something, commits. Then T2 starts, it reads something, X and Y. It's going to create a local copy of X and Y as of the time when uh, it started. At this point, Y is 1, X is not updated. Let's say the initial value is 0. Now T3 comes and writes X and Z. Okay. Now T3 commits also. But T2 does not see the updates of uh, T3. Uh, why? Because it's reading from its snapshot. In its snapshot, uh, Z is uh, 0, X is uh, 0, and Y was also 0. Uh, y is 1, sorry. So in its snapshot, if, even though T3 has already committed here and set Z to 3, T2 is now doing a read Z. What is the value it gets? It gets 0 because it's reading from its snapshot. Read y, well, it updated it, so it is seeing uh, the value 1. All, uh, even if this value was 0 here, uh, it would see 1. Um, now, uh, this part, uh, write x equal to 3, what happens? Now, uh, it requests a commit. Okay? So here, what snapshot isolation does is it checks, was there a concurrent transaction which wrote a data item which T2 wrote. So in this case, T2 has written X, and there was a concurrent transaction. This was T3 was concurrent with T2. It also wrote X. At this point, uh, T3 uh, has already committed. When T2 does a commit request, it is rolled back. So this step essentially does validation. Uh, so snapshot isolation does uh, some kind of validation similar to the optimistic concurrency protocol. But the exact validation is different. It only validates its writes. It does not validate its reads. And this can get it into trouble, as we will show in the uh, over here. We have two transactions. Uh, one of them uh, reads y and assigns it to x. The other y reads x and assigns it to y. So let's say x is 3, y is 17. In any serial execution, what would x and y be? If t1 ran first, it will set x to 17, and both will be 17. Then t2 will set uh, y back. Uh, you know, both are already 17, so t2 in effect doesn't change anything. On the other hand, if t2 ran first, it will set y to 3, and x will also be 3. And then if t1 runs subsequently, it will set x back to 3, so no change. So in any serial execution, the final value of x and y would be either 3 or 17. No other value is possible. But in snapshot isolation, both start at the same time, they both get a snapshot. In that snapshot, x equal to 3, y equal to 17. Both of them see the snapshot. Now, t2 will set x is e uh, y equal to 3, while t1 sets x equal to 17. And neither of them updates a common item. I mean, they, they don't update any common item. And both are allowed to commit. And the net result is that x and y are swapped. So in case you didn't understand it, what is happening is the Commit check for snapshot isolation only looks at what items these transactions write. It does not look at what they read. And if you look at what they write, T1 and T2 write two different things. And if they read from a snapshot, you have a situation where they swap values, X and Y swap values, 
which is impossible in any serial execution of T1 and T2. Therefore, snapshot isolation does not ensure serializability. That is the take home message here. And there are other ways it can happen with inserts and so on. I will skip the details. Um, now, uh, the bottom line is that Oracle, even if you tell it to run in serializable isolation level, will run snapshot isolation. And the net result is transactions may not be serializable. Now, you can, you might wonder how on earth is the leading database uh, in the world getting away with this. Uh, you tell it to be serializable and it is not. And the answer is they get away with it because most people do not notice it. Uh, in fact, somebody showed that uh, one of the widely used benchmarks, uh, 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 serialization problems will not occur with snapshot isolation because of uh, certain ways in which the transactions are written. So, it turns out that serialization violations are not common. But that does not mean they cannot occur. In fact, in IIT Bombay, we had our financial system written by TCS. Uh, the people who wrote the system were pretty smart, um, and uh, but they did not fully understand snapshot isolation. We used Oracle. And a couple of years after the system was launched, our financial auditor said, hey, your account books have this situation where two different transactions have the same ID. And that is, uh, you know, a violation of financial rules. You cannot have two uh, people being given receipts with the same number. That is like you uh, issued a duplicate receipt and ate up the money. Uh, so, they pointed out a violation. And we said, how did this happen in the code? And after a bunch of sleuthing, we finally realized that it was because of snapshot isolation. It does not ensure serializability. And it turned out the TCS people, I think from their seniors, they had heard about this issue somehow. Uh, but they had tried to solve it, but they had not succeeded in solving it. They did not know how to solve it. Um, so, there is a partial solution using uh, something called cell, a, a for update clause. I would not get into the details, uh, which Oracle supports. PostgreSQL also supports it, uh, but it is not complete. It, because the phantom, even if you use this, there is no clean way to deal with the phantom phenomenon. Uh, so, even with this, it is not good enough. So, there is a issue. Uh, it, now, what happened is uh, Postgres 9.1 uh, changed their concurrency control. They implement a variant of snapshot isolation, which is which they call serializable snapshot isolation. Um, I won't get into the details, but the bottom line is that uh, if you use PostgreSQL 9.1 or greater, uh, serializability is assured. It also does um, what is called predicate locking to prevent the phantom problem. So, it actually is now clean. There is no problem with PostgreSQL 9.1 onwards, and that is the system which you will use. Interestingly, when I ran this lab in 2010, at that time the latest version of Postgres did not have this fix. So, the same lab exercise which you are running today uh, would have returned uh, slightly different results back in 2010. Um, so, anyway, uh, we have changed the exercises a little bit. Uh, so, which what you are running is not exactly the same as what they ran, because now one of the exercises to show lack of serializability fails now in the sense that uh, it, it, it is actually serializable. So, we kind of dropped that exercise because it did not help you too much unless you fully understand snapshot isolation and I have only skimmed it. So, uh, we will not worry about it. The bottom line of today's exercises is to see what happens when you run transactions concurrently. And what you will see is that uh, in Postgres uses snapshot isolation. There are some exercises which, which reveal this. At the same time, you will also see that uh, PostgreSQL uses some kind of locking internally, uh, and the exercises will uh, demonstrate that to you. So, with that, I will uh, stop on concurrency control. There are a couple of things on weak isolation levels, which I have already covered. There is also something on concurrency in index structures, which I am going to skip. Uh, so, that is it for concurrency control. I will take one or two questions and then move on to recovery. Okay. Now, we have Sarvajanik Surat. Please go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning. So, my question is, uh, when uh, transactions, when uh, concurrent transactions are executed, mm -hmm. does database take into consideration uh, sort test, job first method or such kind of round robin uh, to, or, or does it uh, depend upon operating system process management for such kind of execution of concurrent transactions? 
that is a good question. Uh, so, this question is about scheduling of transactions. Uh, so, if uh, you have a long transaction and a short transaction, um, you know, should the database give priority to short transactions over long ones and uh, how is this priority dealt with? Uh, the answer is that most databases uh, do not provide very much control on uh, priority here. Uh, so, what happens is that uh, each transaction is run in a separate thread or process and it is left to the default scheduling to uh, give priority to different processes. Uh, however, uh, there is an area called real time databases where uh, you want to give priority to certain transactions over others. Uh, so, people have uh, built uh, prototypes at least of real time databases uh, where you can set priorities uh, and, and these have been researched quite extensively. Uh, and different uh, prioritization schemes have been shown to have uh, work uh, better than others. Uh, now, practically, uh, does any of the current generation databases support uh, these kind of priorities? I do not think so, although some of them may have some underlying features, but they do not uh, do a great job of scheduling per se. They just allow the default and as you said, let if, if PostgreSQL just runs a number of processes and the OS priority, uh, you know, defines the order in which things are run. There is no other prioritization done by the database. Any follow up question? Hello. Yeah. Sir, I have one more question. Uh, query optimization, concurrency control, uh, recovery, all these involves cost. Is there any situation where database decides to avoid these and just to execute the transaction serially? That is a good question. Uh, so, the question is that uh, concurrency control has a cost. Uh, so, is there any situation where databases uh, decide that the cost is not worth paying and run things serially? That is a very good question. Now, uh, if you have data on disk, um, here concurrency pays off a lot because uh, when you run a transaction, if it does uh, disk I/O, that can block for uh, you know say 10 milliseconds. And that is a significant amount of time in a high performance database system. Uh, and you really do not want the whole database to be blocked in such a situation. On the other hand, if you have a main memory database where uh, there is never any I.O., everything is resident in memory, this kind of a thing would not happen. The second issue is when you have a very long transaction that blocks uh, other transactions behind it. So, if you have a main memory database where every transaction is guaranteed to be very short, there are no long transactions then it is not clear that all the price you pay for concurrency control is worth it. In fact, there have been studies which have shown that uh, in this situation, main memory databases with only very short transactions, it is not worth doing concurrency control. You might as well just run things serially. Again, this was in an era where uh, processors were single core, this was some time ago. Uh, today, you have multi-core uh, processors which can run many things in parallel. So, I am not sure if that result holds today even on uh, a regular uh, you know single uh, system which because it has so many cores uh, there is overhead to concurrency control but you can run transactions in parallel and the overhead of locking will probably pay off in such a multi core system but it's a good question people have asked it and done research on this question uh, padampat singhania rajasthan good morning sir uh, this is akhilesh sharma from sir padampat singhania university uh, we would like to congratulate you first of all and uh, we are having one question that uh, how view serializable schedules are good for maintaining concurrency between the transactions. Uh, so, first of all, uh, if you remember, uh, you know, I mentioned that there is something called view serializability, but did not go into the definition of it. Now, the question is, uh, is it ever useful? And it turns out when you use timestamp protocols, uh, I briefly mentioned a particular check. Uh, let me go back and show you that slide. In this slide, if you see step number 2, this was uh, the timestamp protocol uh, when you issue a write uh, uh, operation here. So, what happens here is if the timestamp of the transaction which is trying to do the write is less than the write timestamp of Q, then TI is attempting to write an obsolete value and it is rejected and TI is rolled back. So, uh, this a particular step would uh, violate uh, the conflict order. Now, there is an optimization of this particular step which says that yes, it is trying to do an obs obsolete write.
However, instead of rejecting it, let us just ignore it and let T i continue. Okay, this is a very, very uh, specific optimization. It has been proposed. It is a interesting observation uh, that obsolete rights can be ignored. Um, so, now if you do that, it turns out that the schedules which you get are not actually conflict serializable, uh, but they are view serializable. And the idea is that that particular right, there was a conflict, uh, but you could ignore it because the uh, value which it wrote was anyway overwritten by another guy subsequently. And that is the key difference between conflict and view serializability. View serializability ignores certain conflicts uh, if it had no impact on the uh, later state. So, essentially the write which you did should have been clobbered by somebody else without a in intervening read. Now, this is kind of rare. It is not a huge thing, hugely important thing in practice. So, uh, yes, there is a cute optimization, but in practice I do not think it has a huge impact. Uh, so, view serializability is not viewed as something which is uh, terribly important. Uh, go back to you for your next question. Uh, sir, uh, this question it is uh, not related to this topic. Uh, actually, I just wanted to know you spoke about big data now, but there is another concept of data warehousing, data mining, where there is a multi dimensional data. So, um, if uh, there uh, this is in distributed environment, how we manage concurrency and uh, indexing in, in that context? If you can highlight uh, sure. some. Uh, yeah. So, data warehousing uh, as also the uh, big data scenarios which we saw. Uh, yesterday with Hadoop are all for decision support where you are not doing updates on the fly. Uh, the updates have already been done somewhere and uh, those updates are coming to you. So, the actual transaction processing system that needed to deal with concurrency is already done and it is just telling you that these things happen. So, there is no need for concurrency control at this level. Uh, essentially, uh, you know you can do the updates periodically or even if you do it uh, regularly, uh, read-only transactions could perhaps use a snapshot or whatever. Uh, so, uh, not by snapshot I mean uh, logical snapshot, not, not a physical one. You can keep timestamps and make sure that they ignore uh, things with a later timestamp. So, uh, this is basically how uh, these systems, the data warehousing systems, avoid the issues of concurrency control. They either uh, do snapshots or they do not allow updates all the time, they do updates periodically when transactions are, when other transactions are not running. Um, and when you have a distributed setting for decision support, there is no real change, concurrency control is not an issue. However, if you have a regular uh, transaction processing system, which itself has to be distributed uh, running across many machines for performance or other reasons, it need not just be performance, uh, you can have a um, a company which has two databases uh, and you need to do a transaction which spans those two databases. It has uh, reads and writes maybe in both the databases. So, how do you manage this? Now, again in this short course I have not had time to get into distributed transactions, but in the book there is a chapter on distributed databases and that talks about two of these issues. The first issue, let me write it down here. So, in distributed databases, the first issue is atomic update. When you have two different machines running uh, database software, you do an update in one and then uh, there is a failure before the update happens in the other one, uh, you have a problem. Uh, how do uh, centralized databases avoid this? They have a log which uh, they run on recovery and we are going to see that as the next topic. But in a distributed database that becomes uh, harder because there is no control on recovery, each is independent. So, for this there is a thing called two phase commit protocol, which is widely used. Uh, in fact, on this uh, same whiteboard, um, I mentioned Google Spanner and I said it is a distributed database. In fact, Google Spanner implements two phase commit as one of the options for doing transactions that span multiple sites. There are other options also that it supports. Uh, and this is a very old idea. I mean, many databases support it. Do not get the idea that Google invented it. Google merely uses it. Uh, the second thing is uh, distributed concurrency control. Okay. 
So, again there are uh, techniques which have been uh, developed for this. Uh, if each of them does locking, two phase locking, it turns out that everything works fine, except for deadlock detection. So, uh, locking can go ahead as usual, but you need a uh, distributed deadlock detection mechanism. Uh, again, these are all described in the book. Uh, if each of them does its own thing, one guy does locking, another does snapshot and so on, then life is more complicated and then there are alternatives um, which people have proposed to ensure uh, serializability in spite of transactions spanning multiple sites. Uh, so, that is a brief uh, reply. I think uh, I will stop here on questions on concurrency control. Thank you.